Welcome back to our 54th episode of the Launcher Farm Show, where I interview Brandon Doyle with Remax Results in Minnesota. In this episode, Brandon and I talk about why you need to take the time to track your business and what simple metrics you should be considering. Brandon shares how he uses his passions to connect with other like-minded people in his community and how you can do the same. And we talk about what metrics Brandon uses when choosing a farm and how you can track your own numbers in your farm. Plus, a super easy way to track your business to ensure you get more deals from all your strategies. And we talk about how to create your own customized content marketing plan to add value to your farm. Plus, a ton of other ideas that you can use to grow your geographic farm. So be sure to check out this episode, like and subscribe, and enjoy the episode with Brandon. Welcome back to another episode of the Launcher Farm Show. I'm your host, Ryan Smith, and today we've got a great guest. It's Brandon Doyle from Remax in Minnesota. So Brandon, take a second, tell us a bit about yourself and why you're here. Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, so my name is Brandon Doyle. I'm an agent with Remax Results in Maple Grove, Minnesota. I've got a father-son team, and I've uh, co-authored a book and then written two others of my own. And so I'm mostly around real estate marketing, business planning. And my big contribution is that I'm all about, all about metrics. So uh, measuring, uh, you know, what you're doing and then using uh, those, that, those data points to make better decisions in the future. Uh, continue to tweak all of your marketing methods until you, uh, you strike gold. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I just recently uh, released a blog article about numbers and how numbers are sexy. And it's important to really track your business, what you're doing, what you're not doing. And there are specific metrics that are great. There's specific metri- metrics that are important. And some people focus on some metrics that they probably don't need to. And there's other metrics they probably blow over. So I want, before we dive into what you do and how you've done that, I want to take you back to the past and then share how you got into the business and what that looked like for you and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, sure. So uh, my father has been in the business for 20 something years and I actually went to college and got a uh, bachelor's of science in real estate. Uh, My goal was actually to do commercial real estate because at the time I thought, you know, residential is all nights and weekends. It kind of is. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, But so I did commercial real estate appraisal for a little while after college. That was around 2008. And then when uh, the market kind of crashed and it was kind of, it was fee-based, I kind of ran out of work. Uh, So I... uh, went into hospitality for a while and then eventually uh, my dad convinced me to get uh, to go into residential sales Uh, so I did that about 10 years ago Uh, since that time I went back and got my master's in real estate and then uh, we at one point grew our team Uh, I think we had like 16 members at one point and then I kind of decided that uh, you know in order to be really profitable as a team you need to be very big and we're kind of in that uh, mid-range we didn't like it so it just, I wanted to focus on selling uh, so we actually kind of downsized our team to where we're at now we really focus on uh, organic type of marketing uh, we do a lot with online stuff and moved a little bit away from farming but have certainly had our success uh, with establishing a geo farm here in our area mid Grove. we're uh, fairly dominant in the area uh, so yeah, to this day, I, I'm still a practicing real estate agent. On the side, I do speaking at different conferences. I would say I kind of took 2020 off there, and <laughs> now things are starting. I'm starting to get booked again you know, for this fall and into, into next year. Uh, and I've kind of changed my focus away from marketing. Now I'm talking about smart home tech. Uh, you'll see behind me a little joke. Uh, random stuff I've been testing. So I write for Realtor Magazine. I write for Inman News. And I've got a weekly column. And I, before uh, switching to smart home tech, it's all about marketing, different ways to market yourself, uh, business planning. And now it's all been just testing products and, and writing about a different tech for your house, which I really enjoy. Uh, so when I'm on stage, I'm either talking about smart home tech or marketing, one of the two. Nice. So you wear yeah. worn many hats and you've got a lot of experience, which is awesome to see. And obviously you had an evolution in your business, which is is important because I think a lot of people get into the business and they kind of just stay stagnant or stale and don't adapt or don't evolve. You've obviously grown through that. I want to go back to that beginning part of switching from 
commercial into residential real estate. Because a lot of people I find, uh, we've talked about many times on the show, is they get into real estate for two reasons. One, they have a family member, which is kind of the path you went down, or it's a happenstance thing. What caused you to make that jump into residential? Was it just your father's influence? Or was there something that drove you into saying, hey, this is the right fit for me? Yeah, I just wasn't happy with uh, the way my career was going in hospitality. It's kind of pretty much dead end. <laughs> and not a lot of money to be made. Uh, on the commercial side, I certainly would have stuck with the price if, uh, if the opportunity was there, but you needed to get these uh, training hours and there just wasn't enough work at the time. And mm -hmm. so I didn't, I didn't want to do residential appraisals because it just wasn't fun for me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm really, I guess it was you know, the opportunity to make a lot of money is what brought me in. And a lot of it was just like him and I having lunch and I make recommendation what he could be doing better about marketing mm -hmm. uh, you know, coming from a younger viewpoint or the digital standpoint yep. and he was doing a lot of the old school marketing and mailing stuff and and so i think together we make a really good team because of that he's got 20 something years of experience and so if there's any ever an odd situation he just knows how to work through it and then you know older the older generation certainly relates to him yep. uh, when we go on our listing appointments and then I, of course, bring the digital side. We were kind of pioneers in our state for being the first to do the 360 tours, being the nice. first to do drones. Uh, we've got in, on the front page of our uh, regional newspaper, the Star Tribune, uh, for the, both of those things. So that's kind of cool to be on that cutting edge of things. Yeah. And that was like seven years ago. And now all, both of those are just super commonplace. Like, it's not like, oh, wow, I've never <laughs> seen this before. So, yeah. Uh, we even did like a uh, virtual reality for a while and then we determined it's kind of gimmicky. No one's putting on, no one wants <laughs> yeah, to yeah. put on the goggles to see. Yeah. That, so. uh, I, it was I cool bought a set to, to test it. it out just to see. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't see this taking off enough that people, yeah. and I want to pass on used headsets to people just to. Yeah, it. exactly. And honestly, the experience I think is better on like an iPad or computer screen, more intuitive to navigate and, and share it with someone else. Whereas a headset you're you know, you can't see what the other person saying. Yeah. It's kind of, kind of odd, but. Yeah. So I want to dive into the numbers technology. section because that's, that's a big thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's great. So numbers are important to you, obviously coming from the appraisal background with yep. obviously that's a, a big numbers thing. And, and your book is about the metrics. What got you interested in really focusing on the residential side and how did you really start to learn what metrics were important? Because again, there's a lot of things that you could focus on and there's a lot of things that people do focus on and don't focus on. How did that look like for you to really start narrowing down what to focus on and, and what worked yeah so when i first got in the business i just trying to look at what other successful agents were doing and then kind of like I'll just copy that you know uh, and so i saw that a a number of like big name agents in our, our area were advertising in this book that goes out it's in all like the gas stations mm. uh, it's like this little home magazine and i thought no that's the ticket so i <laughs> you know signed the contract i think it was a year-long contract and after a year, I had gotten like two leads out of it, and they were just terrible leads. <laughs> and so that uh, winter, some of my friends were all going down to Mexico, and I didn't have the money to go with, <laughs> you know, because I had bought into this program thinking it was this uh, silver bullet, and it really wasn't. And so, like, it was a really hard lesson to learn. And from that moment forward, I was like, okay, I'm gonna really hold my marketing dollars accountable. And then the more I dug into it, you know, all these sales people were trying to sell you something. And so they would quote like vanity metrics and things that just don't matter. Yeah. So it was really drilling down into like, what's my return on investment? What's my cost per sale? And then uh, digging even deeper into it, you know, going down that sales funnel, like how many leads am I getting? How many are turning into appointments? And of those appointments, how many turn into sales and ultimately commission? Uh, and so... I uh, started just tracking it in Excel, and then eventually I, I got Sisu, which is a great program for teams. It creates a nice dashboard. Um, nice. But I, I still use Excel because I like. <laughs> I, like <laughs> I just like having it in, in this format that I had made myself. So, uh, yeah, I, every month I go through and I, I do a profit and loss statement, and then I just update our numbers uh, where we're at. Uh, the different marketing categories, kind of quarterly make uh, longer term business decisions, make sure we're like on track and then annually adjust our, our marketing spend. So. Yeah. 
So can we dive into your book then? I know the 3M book is what I read about yours. Yep. And I think it's a, it's a great book. That's kind of how I ha- heard about you. And then Valerie connected us. Um, can you talk about the premise of that and, and what people should be looking at when it comes to the metrics then? Yeah, so uh, the first book that I co-authored was Mindset Method of Metrics, Winning as a Modern Real Estate Agent. Uh, yeah, you read there and also has a companion workbook as well, which is really good. Uh, but so that came about because Nick Dreyer and I, a good friend of mine, were out at Inman. I had been nominated for an Innovator Award and we just happened to be out there. So we stayed together and hung out quite a bit. But after some session, uh, and we, were, we had kind of, we're just recapping the day and we're uh, talking about how like all these speakers were either in luxury markets uh, or had like situations that we couldn't really relate to. Mm-hmm. And we were saying, you know, what we really need and what agents need is like real world numbers. You yeah. know, what are you doing uh, like exactly? And, and put something behind it, like put, uh, dollars, you know, and make it relatable. Uh, so we kind of set out, we had this crazy idea over, over some beers that we should write a book and we would, you know, get influence from all of our friends around the country, you know, that are doing well in the different areas. Yeah. Uh, and then we would uh, put that together. So we actually started a Kickstarter uh, for that book. And at nice. the time it was going beyond your sphere because, you know, everyone knows about marketing to your sphere, but what else is there to do? And so that was kind of, kind of the original premise. Uh, and then after getting funding, we actually partnered with another uh, gentleman, Marshall Saunders, who was the previous co-owner of Remax Results, the largest Remax franchise in the world, oh. where I'm still employed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we kind of combine our viewpoints. And my approach really was about, you know, I was all about metrics and measurement, whereas Marshall was kind of more about coming from a mindset and having a business plan in place and thinking like an owner yep. and then Nick had shared, you know, these different tactics that he's seen. Uh, and so together, I think there, there was a lot of overlap and there was a lot of, there's a couple of things we didn't quite see eye to eye on, but, <laughs> uh, you know, we came to agreement for what would work for, for the book. And so we yep. kind of come up with this contact method. And, um, and so I, afterwards I had a lot of content left over. And I was finally getting people were getting back to me about, um, you know, contributing because when we first wrote the first book, I wanted to have contributions from people. And so I reached out to a ton of people with interview questions. And, uh, it took people a very long time to get back to me. Everyone says that they want to you know, be a part of it. Yep. You know, you know how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so afterwards, I created a real estate marketing playbook. Uh, and here we go. I actually have a copy. Nice. It just happens to be sitting here. Uh, so each chapter of that book kind of references a different marketing method. And it's kind of just written so that you can just skip around and like whatever you're interested in. You can just jump to that. And like today I'm going to learn about uh, organic website traffic. Uh, and then at the end, I put like resources and stuff and have had some case studies. Uh, and then from there, I had to the rest of the content and created success rate, which is basically my viewpoint of like the sales funnel, uh, but written for all small businesses. So beyond just real estate, because nice. the feedback we got from our first book was that people really liked it. And they're like, wow, this would actually be applicable to my friend who's a plumber or, you know, to my accountant, like they should use these same tactics. And so, uh, yeah, I, I wrote that and I launched it right before the pandemic. So I, <laughs> in this closet to my right have about a pallet worth of books sitting there uh, <laughs> that I would have sold at conferences yeah. after, after speaking, <laughs> but now they're here collecting us. <laughs> so that was just unfortunate timing. Well, the things are opening up again, which like you said, it will be good for you to, to continue on in that. And re, I think a lot of people will be re-looking at, and that's what I've seen in my own coaching and training stuff that people are re-figuring out and going, what can I do now? What's going to work? They've yeah. taken the last year to really rethink their business and, and start opening things up. I want to dive into the numbers around farming because that's one that I'm passionate about as well, mm-hmm. because a lot of agents don't look at the numbers as a whole. And one of the numbers that gets passed around is just the, the turnover rates. And that's the number that people have heard. That's the number they focus on. And that's something yeah. I, it doesn't drive me nuts, but it's, I always tell people that's a metric, but it's not the only metric and the most important metric. 
I always use the example of my, my health as an example. I'm like, if I just take my blood pressure and say, is my blood pressure okay? Therefore I'm healthy. It's, there's so many other things that you have to take into consideration when you're choosing a farm and working with your farm. What metrics have you seen around geographic farming that would be an important thing for agents to look at? Yeah, so the big things that I look at when choosing an area is one, the turnover rate, of course, because you know you can have this great neighborhood, but if uh, nobody ever sells in there, then what, what's the point? Uh, yep. So I try to look for ones where they're, you know, the houses are very similar to each other. Um, there's little to no competition. You know, there's already a dominant agent that might be very difficult to break into. Um, and then, you know, just some like a uh, price point that matches your business model, because yep. of course I could go mail to all the luxury listings, but the first thing they're going to ask me is, have you sold a house so that's $5 million? Yeah. And I can just I already know I have it. And so unless you know someone in that neighborhood, uh, it's going to be very difficult to break in into that market. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of how I start you know, looking at, you know, how many homes there are, proximity, uh, to my office or like how familiar I am with it yep. I'm kind of breaking it down that way. And you know, it has to be a certain size minimum. You know, if it's too small of an area, you're not going to get the impact you're looking for. So it needs to be big enough, but not too big that it's too expensive to maintain or too time, uh, time consuming. So really finding that, uh, that perfect area and then, you know, building off of that as you start to have success in, in one part of town, you might expand or, uh, you might start with just one condo building and become, and then you go to the next condo and the next one and you know, the condo king or queen, if you will, yep. if that's your thing. So, yeah, I always tell people it's better to scale up than to scale back, and it's better to take over than to yep. have to, to keep scaling back or trying too much, too big, too quick, and then blowing your budget, not doing it correctly, yeah, but- not testing it, not checking your metrics, and then then going, oh crap, I gotta. Mm-hmm. dump that and then most people give up completely so you mentioned that you grew your team really big and then scaled back can you yep. talk to me about that and, and how that plays into metrics and, and measurements because a lot of agents as we know are vanity based and try to grow a team large and then try we'll keep it afloat and sometimes you said it's more profitable to be scaling back so like what what did that look like for you guys yeah so as we were growing it was great uh we were primarily using like billow leads and then organic leads that we had of our own, just from like time calls and uh, people inquiring on our own properties, open houses, things like that. Yeah. Uh, so we had a, a surplus of leads that we were able to give out to the buyers. And then the flip side is that you know, we kept all the listing leads uh, for ourselves and that was fine and dandy. Uh, but then you know, costs started to ramp up for things like Zillow and realtor.com. Uh, yeah. And we were keeping track of our cost per sale or cost per lead. Uh, they changed how it worked. You know, it was that warm concierge handoff instead. Uh, whereas we had the systems in place to convert the leads, which is kind of what we based off our, our business model off of. And so uh, the splits that I created in the beginning were based on them doing the prospecting. Right. Uh, and so when they're no longer doing the prospecting, the math doesn't work out anymore. <laughs> and so it's a tough conversation to have with someone. Yeah. Uh, but basically it was just uh, kept track of our profitability we slowly saw that like those areas were becoming unprofitable and I was having to switch other like funds to keep that afloat. And mm-hmm. at, at the end of the day, and I was very transparent with the agents that we work with. Uh, just say, you know, here's, here's what the costs were. Here's what the costs are now. Here's the conversion that we were seeing. Here's what we're getting now. So I, I can tell you that the numbers don't add up. Like I, <laughs> I'm in this to make, like, I need to at least make money or break. <laughs> you know, I can't. Yeah keep subsidizing uh, your income. Yep. And so they understood. Uh, and we agreed it would be, they'd be better off you know, on their own. Yep. Uh, do their own thing. And so uh, one of them went off on his own and is successful. Another uh, went and joined a different team, not so successful anymore. And another guy just got out of business completely. And then one of our gals moved out of state. And then another just basically is a referral agent at this point. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it, it worked out fine because our our growth numbers, they probably stayed about the same, maybe a little bit lower. Um, but our net numbers went through the roof because we were able to cut so much expense. Yeah. Like I in one year cut fifty thousand dollars in ad spend and still our found out that our income was around the same. So there just wasn't 
into our bottom line, which is nice. And then also we spend less time, you know, managing people. Yeah. Because their problems just became our problem. Yeah. Uh, and so being able to just focus my time and energy on processing and following up with my own people has actually worked out better. And that's part of why it's so important to be tracking everything because so many agents don't do that. Agents, there, there's a large group of agents who hate numbers, don't want to look at things yeah. and they dread even looking or even thinking about a profit and loss statement. But when you can do that correctly and when you're monitoring on an ongoing basis, you can see those trends happen. You can see those shifts. Otherwise, they just keep writing their checks and, and keep paying yeah. things out and then go, why do I not have money? That's why it's so yeah. important to really to monitor what you're doing. And it's like a revolving door for these marketing companies. You know, yeah. it's like oh, that, that agent uh, got really excited about it. Uh, they tried it, it didn't work out. But guess what? There's a whole line of agents behind them that we can do things. And, you know, for every tactic that we cover, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that are like, oh, that doesn't work for me. Yeah. Uh, but there's going to be one or two where they're just absolutely killing it on that. And there's certainly agents to this day that are doing great on Zillow. We just yeah. weren't one of them. Yeah. Uh, so it's not that it's bad. It just it wasn't working for us. And so we needed to pivot. Uh, and like you said, uh, tracking those metrics allowed us to be able to do that and see it before it was too late yeah and that's that's when you do it not when you're you're bankrupt going oh crap maybe yeah. we should start over and that that's the keys yeah. you pivoted and, and shifted as you saw those things change yep. so for you obviously you have a number of different sources and you teach different marketing sources have you tracked s styles or sources of marketing that have been more efficient or more better that agents generally are, are seeing better returns on versus other because there are a thousand ways to do this business have you seen <laughs> kind of a shift or what what's it look like for you after watching those yeah i would say for each person just to find what they're passionate about and, and go with it because some people are going to be repulsed by the idea of like door knocking or uh, doing community events or maybe they don't want to cold call um, they don't like internet leads you know, they just gotta figure out what works for them and then kind of stick with that. Uh, yep. But obviously if you can't master, if you haven't mastered your sphere of influence, you know, that's that's the first step, you know, yep. creating events, uh, you know, having systems in place to follow up. Uh, and then from there, I see people either go in the path of internet leads, open houses, uh, new construction, geographic farming, you know, you pick your, pick what you want to do <laughs> and then that kind of becomes their focus uh, and that's where they're getting the second most amount of, of their business mm -hmm. and for us i would say right now it goes uh number one would be sphere of influence number two would be our new construction business it's a huge part and then number three is actually organic internet traffic just because of all their the content i've created mm -hmm. around our community over the years um if you had asked like a few years back when i was for starting, it would probably be you know, more open houses and internet leads were right. much higher up on the list. Uh, and then for a while, there was uh, a lot of it was our geographic farming, even just mailers was a, a good chunk for a while. And yep. so it kind of just shift around. Uh, it actually expired listing was huge for us. And now it's like the idea of having expired listing is ridiculous because <laughs> <laughs> the inventory is so low. It's like, yeah, that the property didn't sell is probably a really good reason. Yeah, most like price. Uh, so uh, that that tactic kind of became less fruitful for us, and so we just kind of stopped focusing on it. Of course, when the market turns, we're going to probably ramp up on expired listings again, yep. and that will be a, a good source for us if we have the systems in place. So. Yeah, and you know how to do it. You said you've done it before, and you're again, you know when to do it, when not to do it, when to pull back, when to double down, and that matters too. Because a lot of times agents will do one thing, and that's their only trick, and then they just do that, and then the market changes, and then they yeah. don't have something else in place. And that's one of the things I teach all the time. Is I call it I develop call the scope method, and it's okay. self promotion, community, online prospecting, and education, and you should have a balance in your business by making sure you're hitting kind of all of those pillars. You can cross them over and, and layer your, your strategies together. But when you have those in place, you can make sure you protect yourself. And I use COVID as an example all the time that if someone went out and did door knocking and open houses and then COVID hits, your strategies are literally toast because you <laughs> can't go out, you can't meet people. So you have to make yep. sure you've got enough strategies in place that either help each other overlap enough that you can kind of protect your business as a whole 
And then you can also track to see, okay, what's doing well, what's not doing well, where, where can I spend more money? Where should I pull back on? If you're just doing one thing, and that's where a lot of traditional farming, it's like, just send out postcards. And that alone is not enough. You got to make sure you've got some other things in place. So for you guys, you obviously you've adapted and you've shifted now that COVID's kind of not slowing down, but shifted and changing. Where do you see that going forward for your team now? Yeah, I think we'll, uh, we'll focus on more of, of the same. I think what it really did for us is to like highlight it that we, like you said, we can't rely on one source. Yeah. Uh, Cause like our new construction business uh, took a hit because lumber costs had gone up so fast. Right. That we, you know, the builder couldn't build houses fast enough. Yeah. So we're, you know, kind of seeing delays there. And of course, uh, push back on commission as well because what is a very valid argument. We're not doing, <laughs> we can't do open houses. Uh, right. So we can't pre sell. Uh, so we're going to conundrum there. But uh, yeah, and there was just a lot of things that I think agents in general were doing uh, that. Afterwards, I found out like, oh, I guess I didn't really need to do any of that stuff. Uh, and so they're, they're still just fine. But like having building connections and, and staying connected in a meaningful way is something that uh, is never going to go away. And so the agents that are thriving right now uh, were able to adapt to that. Uh, they realize that a lot of the people that they're encountering, you know, they haven't been out of the house a long time. They yeah. haven't had that social interaction that. Uh, which really never stopped for us because we were deemed essential. I was continuing to show houses yep. other than not doing open houses. Really uh, that much has changed. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we did the a whole like video thing for a hot minute. And then it was determined that that was just, it didn't work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so people want to see the house in person. Yep. Uh, thankfully in our state, we were allowed to do that. Uh, so there was maybe two weeks, two to three weeks where we didn't and then it just, just kind of went back to normal so and i think the important thing in the theme i'm sensing here correct me if i'm wrong is it's all about adapting and evolving and changing as you go along and then that's again going back to the, the, the measuring and tracking your business allows you to do that much more quicker much more efficient efficiently and better you can either spot trends happening or stop it in its track if, if it's hemorrhaging and that allows you to do that and again i, I go back to how many agents say they don't want to put the time in they oh i don't i don't have the time to do that i don't have the energy to do that i don't want to think about those metrics i just i just want to do what i do which is go out and sell and the reality is they would save themselves a lot of time and headache and stress and and money if they were tracking things so for the agents who don't like to do that what would you suggest because there's a lot of agents out there who don't yeah. ever want to think about a number so i mean even as simple as like printing out from the mls the list of your previous sales or something a broker I'll provide you uh, for the last year and just going through and writing down like where did this piece of business come from mm. uh, and if you can't remember that's a big problem uh, <laughs> yeah. but I think what a lot of people realize is that you know their majority of their business is coming from one or two sources and they're probably spending a very disproportionate amount of time on other things yeah. or money uh, that don't really matter or they're busy worrying about what other agents are doing or what new trends are out there like i've been asked a lot like what do you think about tiktok or snapchat and i just asked them like are the people that are on these platforms buyers or sellers are you having real estate conversations yeah. like to me these things are just a different medium uh, for communication uh, so it doesn't really matter how we're communicating like right now we're uh, talking over zoom but it would be no different if we were on the phone or meeting in person or yep. you know chatting on um, social media as long as you're having meaningful conversations uh, that moves the needle and so i think people get too distracted by vanity metrics and yeah. trying to keep up with trends and things that just don't matter uh, it's like just don't worry about that just go <laughs> build relationships have more conversations and sell more real estate hundred yeah, percent. It's really that simple. <laughs> yeah. And that ties into one of the core things that I teach about farming. I call it CPR. And it's really the, what I say is the, the fundamentals of what farming is. You can have any strategy you want, but the core is CPR, which is community positioning and relationships. And you have to have the community right. that you're serving. You have to position yourself as the expert and the ambassador for the community that you're serving. And then as a result, you build relationships. And if you do that, whether it's on TikTok, whether you're doing Zoom videos, whether you're doing online ads, whether you're doing postcards, whatever your strategies are, 
you have to look in my experience, you have to look through, through the lens of that CPR and say, is this help building the community? Is this helping position myself? And is this building relationships? And if you do that, when you start layer together, then you can expand, yeah. but you have to really look at it that way. And like you said, so many people focus on the wrong things like vanity metrics or how many clicks did I get or how many people just saw it. It's like, well, is it furthering the relationships at the end of the day? Cause that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. I like to tell people like you can't take likes and deposit them in the bank. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. They don't take that as a currency. So it's yeah. better. Uh, but I think you really did hit on a good point about how uh, just farming or marketing in general is about layering. And yep. so it's one thing to mail out postcards, but if you're not also doing something in your community, getting your name out there, uh, so you get that facial recognition or, you know, doing something online, you can't just like ignore the online portion. Yeah. If all you're going to do is mail postcards, but you don't even have like a business profile set up, um, you're not going to, and you don't have like reviews, it's not going to be as effective. Whereas if you have all of these things in place, you kind of, you have that synergy. Uh, and then all of the marketing works together and you're going to have much more success. Yeah. And I recently had someone on the show and he was talking about how when he learned to do that, he actually halved his costs. And then he said he he went from 70% conversion rate to a 95% conversion rate as appointments because he layered those strategies together. Yeah. And he's realized that the synergy when you start pulling them together makes it cheaper, easier, and builds more stronger relationships because yeah. they're seeing you in multiple ways and you're hitting people in different methods and mediums and that yep. helps further relationships and not just do, like I said, exactly. doing that one thing yep and so like we track everything with a call action number uh, okay. so we have vanity numbers and that way i know the source and i could easily sit here and say oh all my business is from my website but that would be foolish because it's you know other sources are also driving to the website so the website yep. itself isn't doing it Yep. That just happens to be the point of which they, they made the phone call. Yeah, exactly. So you mentioned you're, you're kind of getting into home, future home tech stuff, or is that from the consumer's perspective or from an agent's perspective? Uh, mostly a consumer uh, perspective. And so uh, we're kind of jumping in and looking at, you know, if I go to the store today and I want to buy a video doorbell, what, you know, what should I buy? Or right. I want to do you know, certain automations in my house. How do, how do I do that? Like, where do I even start? So. <laughs> What we found is a lot of people, they love the idea behind smart home tech. They're just overwhelmed and they don't really know where to start. And so we're kind of uh, taking that point of view and then actually testing out all the products in our homes uh, for an extended period of time and then doing the review and saying, like, okay, here's what we found. Uh, because there's a lot of channels out there that you know, they test it, but they test it in a very like, lab environment. Right. Here's the specs. So like, well, the megapixels doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah. You know, I want to know, like, if someone rings my doorbell, how quickly can I pull it up on my phone? Yeah. Uh, that kind of thing. And so that uh, real world testing has been, it's been a lot of fun. I really in, uh, enjoy it. We've uh, uh, developed some cool relationships with you know, people on the PR side and nice. at the, the companies themselves. They're sending us product to test now, <laughs> That's which, awesome. which is cool. I can't complain about that at all. Yeah. Uh, and then others, you know, I'm purchasing. Uh, so yeah, it's been a fun ride. Uh, we've been doing that for about three years now. So, you know, are you tying that into? Small. Sorry, yeah. Are you tying that into your clients then, and helping passing on to them for value add to them, or is it just something like a side project that you're passionate about, or what's the long? All of the above. <laughs> so, uh, looking for content, good quality content to share uh, with our database that's real estate related, uh, no. but it, you know hits people when they're not thinking about selling. So still top of mind, uh, and that's been a big win for us. And then also you know, kind of growing an audience on on uh, YouTube. Of course, I've got Realtor Magazine and Inman News, which has been good, uh, but uh, creating that resource on YouTube has kind of generated another revenue source through the, the ads and affiliate links, of course. Nice. Uh, so that's better than a poke in the eye and <laughs> makes, it, makes it more fun. Uh, so yeah, a combination of, and I would encourage uh, any agent out there to you know find something that's housing related that's cool, yep. uh, and just talk about it. You know, share it on social media, do whatever. Um, people are interested. So yeah, I, I talk about that in, in some of my training as well. Is is using different groups and, and building your tribe in that you can connect with people with interest specific 
groups and then you may have less people that are finding it but when they find you and you're sharing that if you're into technology if you're into outdoors if you're into if you're a mom and you want to do a mom's group or things like that where you can create a, a sub community within your community yeah. to really add value to them do something you're passionate about you actually enjoy and bring value to the community you serve can help elevate that and you're going to enjoy it while you're doing it. and that's yeah. my idea of fun too yeah for sure the other thing that, we, that i do personally is that i'm really into craft beer Nice. Uh, so every week we go to a different craft brewery around the city so we just invite people and if it's your first time coming to our weekly meetup uh we'll pay for your drinks uh, nice. that way connect with people and then you'll get a lot of people will come back and so each week we probably have six to eight people the different people each time you know yep. we're going to different areas and people's schedules change uh and it's a lot of fun to excuse to connect with people and you know, share a drink and catch up That's awesome. uh, and so it, it's even been I opened it to anyone and people are, are showing up that are like, I didn't know before, which is kind of neat. Yeah. <laughs> and so now I'm, I'm building my database a little bit that way as well. And of course, and you know, I'm wearing my, beer. my, yeah, I wear my post because that's what I wear every day. I'm very uh, <laughs> creature of habit. I wake up, I'm like, oh, polo. Uh, and there I go. But everywhere I go, I am, you know, people realize what I do. I don't have to say anything. And then of course, someone will ask. So, it kind of seems to be top of mind and the same goes for like other uh passions of mine like i'm really big into paintball i, I travel and compete for that and so i've got a, a good group of guys here locally uh, but then even in our community beyond that there's other teams that we play against and they, everyone knows that i'm a real estate agent so I get, yeah i get business that way as well which is kind of cool it's all, see, it's all about the balance. It's about the scope yeah. and the, I call it strategy stacking and you layer those in and, and it just exactly. further grows your business, which is awesome. So if you were to give agents one last piece of advice, if they were thinking of kind of really diving into metrics and really understanding how that can affect their business and how they can use it, what advice would you give? Yeah, I would just start off uh, simple, you know, uh, looking at backwards and maybe at last year's business and look at where your business came from um, and then uh, look at how much you spent in each marketing category, uh, calculate your return on investment or your cost per sale. Uh, yep. That is the simplest thing you can do. And that is a, a good starting point. You know, a lot of people are going to get overwhelmed if we start getting into conversion rates, of conversions, <laughs> all that. Uh, so just starting with super simple like that is going to be helpful. And then you know, as you get into the habit of tracking more often, you can add in different metrics, you can dive deeper into certain areas as you see fit. But then I think the next step is uh, doing a profit loss statement mm -hmm. every month. I think it's very good, uh, not only from a marketing decision-making standpoint, but also just like a business owner hat in general, like when, when do my revenue, when does money come in and like, where are my big expenses? Because uh, where we're at, uh, we're very seasonal. And so it almost makes like a perfect bell curve. Uh, yeah. and so we need to plan for that. Otherwise, you're going to be like, you know, steaks one day and then next <laughs> month, oh, shit, you're having hot dogs. Uh, yeah. So you know, trying to figure that out and plan your marketing around that is yep. very helpful. And then like we had discussed earlier, you know, as you start to track the stuff more, it's a lot easier to pivot. You've got uh, that information and you can make much more intelligent decisions instead of just feeling like this isn't working. Yep. you can definitively say and then i guess one last piece of advice as well would be to stick with it because yep. i see so many agents that they try something and then they give up after like two months where uh, especially with farming it takes you know, six months to a year to really get established and so you might be going 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 and thinking nothing's happening but you're kind of building that brand awareness yep. uh, and then after that it, it should become more profitable and then I recommend reinvesting and growing, but yeah. to each their own. <laughs> you're, you're speaking my language. So <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, I talk about all the time that agents, the, the biggest, one of my, I think the biggest failures in real estate is that they pull it too soon and they try farming. And I've talked to so many hundreds of agents and they're, well, I've tried farming. It's like, no, you yeah. sent out a couple of postcards. That's not farming. The yeah. farming is the, the commitment and that time. And it takes time to build that and you reinvest. And that's something I always talk about. Your farm should fund your farm. That if you do it correctly, you take the money from the, you get from the farm, not all of it, but you take a chunk of it back, you put it back into it. And that's how you grow. And if you, if you wait and just take it out of your savings account, all of a sudden your spouse is going to be yelling at you because it's a slow month and you didn't have a sale and you go, ah, maybe yeah. I won't 
then you start pulling back and it's like, no, if you're watching what you're doing, you're watching where you're spending it. You can either ride that out or go, okay, this isn't the right fit for me and pull back. Yeah. And one of the things that Marshall talked about in our first book is that uh, what he did, he and his wife did early on uh, in their careers, I guess, uh, was that they would live off of the previous year income, which is yep. crazy to think about uh, if you're currently living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, but the more I thought about it, the more I was thinking, like, that's really smart because we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. It was, I mean, COVID is a prime example. Uh, and so a lot of people were in really tough positions in real estate. You know, there's no, no guarantees. Like every day you're out there, uh, you know, interviewing for a job basically because there's not, there, you got to find the next deal. Yeah. Uh, and so my wife and I have kind of embraced that as well. And we're, we, we didn't do a full year, but we built up yeah. that, a six month reserve and we're just kind of trying to live off of like her salary. Uh, yeah. That way we can use mine for investing and for, bigger expenses trips uh, the house car whatever uh, i think that that's been really good uh, so we're not really stressing and marketing wise we have for on our business side uh, so we have llc and s corp all that fun stuff uh, but we had, at the beginning of the year already have allocated all the money nice. for our marketing and so one of these yeah. sales people call me i'm like wow you should talk to me in November because <laughs> I do all my business planning in November and I budget for the entire year yeah. and all my money has been earmarked. So I can't possibly do make any changes yeah. at this time, but yeah. uh, and a few of them actually do follow up in November. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, Let's hear the pitch plan. now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's gotta be good, but, but uh, that's awesome. It, yeah. It called a lot, you know, I'm sure a lot of the agents uh, watching or listening to this are in the same boat where every day their phone is ringing. And it's not, you know, people wanting to buy or sell. It's people wanting to sell us something. Yep. So and kind it's kind of always got the, our guard up. We're kind of worried, like, uh, is this is this person just trying to make money off me? <laughs> and yeah. I feel like, unfortunately, a lot of times they are. So. Yeah. I've heard so this is the easiest way to make money in real estate is sell something to real estate agents. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wrote a couple of books. So that <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I offer training and coaching. So that's what I do. So I get it. So uh, tying, running into books. I always wrap up with the, your best book section. So what's a book you'd recommend? You can recommend your own. If there's any book you think would make an impact on our viewers' lives or that you've had an impact on your own. Yeah, so that, great question. Every year I read every single real estate book uh, that comes out. They're all behind me. I see you have <laughs> quite the collection behind you there as well. Uh, but so at the end of the year, I write a, um, an article for Inman News about the top books of that year. And people will send me their book throughout the year because they, they want to be included in this list because uh, it actually generates a shit ton of sales for these people. I use affiliate links and I know how much, uh, how many copies get sold just on that article alone. Yeah. Uh, so, so I read a lot of them and there's a lot that are either you know, vanity or just regurgitated or mm. horribly edited <laughs> uh, a lot. Uh, but I always go back to, and whenever anyone asks me this question, I always tell the ninja seller. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I've it's heard about, great things about that. Yeah. And I have only read that book after having written our first one. And I was like, wow, this is really good. <laughs> like, yeah. This is like pretty much the same as what we were like talking about. But this is a very, very good book. There's, yeah, he's been a bestseller for a very, very long time. Uh, and then people always say uh, the millionaire real estate agent, but yep. it's at this point it's ten years old, more than that. Yeah, uh, more than ten. Yeah, and, yeah more than 10, yeah. And so I can definitively tell you that the the metrics that are in there, the refer the numbers they reference, are not accurate at all. Yeah, uh, they, they, you could not base your business off that book. I mean, the strategies and tactics that are in there, sure, they they are very solid i agree with them 100 percent. but like the book needs to be updated yeah. there isn't even any mention of social media in this yeah. book, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's how old it is yeah. so uh i would like to see them release a new version and, there is, i know it's in the works i'm with keller williams myself, the works for, but it's been for a while yeah they keep keep getting postponed yeah, so yeah it'd be so nice much. to see it updated for sure uh, well yeah beyond that i'd say uh there's, there's been some pretty good ones i like uh ryan serhant's books just because the energy he brings yeah um some of the other million dollar listing guys he's been a little bit more vanity oriented yeah and then mm -hmm. i would say uh exactly what to post was a pretty good one for social media 
I like that one quite a bit. Heard so. good things about that. Well, I'll have to get you my book when I'm, I'm writing one right now. So I'll have to get it oh, to you so you can oh, yeah. check it out. And, it over. Uh, yeah, so we'll do that. We'll see uh, if you make the bestseller. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Brandon's approved top 10 of the yeah. year. That's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, if you were, uh, we're going to wrap up. We'll thank you for being on the show. How can people check out what you're up to and how can they connect with you? If whether it's your books, your training, your courses, what, what do you got going on and how can people find out what you're up to? Yeah. So the books are really easy to find. Uh, of course, Amazon, um, you can search by my name or you can search by the title uh, and you'll find them that way. As far as social media goes, I would say if you're interested in smart home tech, uh, you can check out home tech decisions. That's uh, a YouTube channel that we started. Uh, beyond that, I really just use Facebook. Uh, so I hang out in a lot of the big Facebook groups that I'm sure many agents are already a part of, and I contribute there. Uh, beyond that, I don't I do not do much. I have a, <laughs> I have Instagram, but it's a few pictures of my dog occasionally. And beyond <laughs> that, I, I don't really go on there. So uh, nice. there's that. Uh, but yeah, I'm pretty easy to find. Awesome. We'll put it in the show notes so people can check that out and connect with you and check out the books. Like I said, I, I read your first book. It's awesome. It's great. It's it's nice because it's relevant and it, you have three different perspectives, but you said it ties together, which is nice. So it's definitely worth checking out. So thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom, sharing your experience. And I know my viewers are going to get a lot out of it. So thank you for being on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take care. Thanks. Thanks for checking out today's episode. If you'd like more videos like this, be sure to sub- like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our Facebook page and our other social media channels. Looking forward to bringing you more great content like this and happy farming.